folks, and welcome back to the second episode of Forgotten Knowledge. In today's world of farming, if you think about harvesting hay, you probably think either big round bales or big square bales, primarily because they can be processed and uh, moved and stored by large um, hydraulic equipment and uh, it doesn't require a lot of manpower. You, maybe one person can do all of this as opposed to the way things were done 70 years ago. 70 years ago, my family harvested and stored loose hay. And today I'll go through that procedure with you in detail uh, with some interesting pictures and videos interspersed throughout it. The first thing we had to do is get the hay on the ground and get it cut. and. Uh, Dad had had a tractor since 1952, but he used to cut hay with a team of horses, with a horse-drawn mower. Well, he had a three-point hitch uh, sickle bar mower that he pulled behind the tractor or had on the tractor, but he didn't like the way that it, it cut the hay. It left the field looking kind of ragged, and he liked to cut every single straw that was possible. So he took one of those old McCormick Deering uh, horse-drawn mowers that he had, and he modified and adapted it to pull behind the tractor. He shortened the tongue and put a, a tractor hitch on it so that we could uh, hitch it to the drawbar of the tractor. Had a six foot uh, cutter bar on it, but most of these, including that one, uh, had steel wheels and dad didn't like that to pull behind a tractor. So he somehow uh, engineered it so that he could put uh, rubber tired wheels on it. And that's the way that he cut hay. And when I first started cutting hay, I was probably nine or 10 years old uh, driving the tractor. I was pulling uh, one of those horse drawn McCormick Deering uh, mowers. And it did a great job of cutting the hay. After we had the hay on the ground, then we had to get it raked into windrows. And uh, we had a side delivery John Deere rake uh, that operated on the three-point hitch. It wasn't a pull type. It was actually fastened to the three-point hitch. And the reels of that rake ran off the PTO of the tractor. Now, I especially like to rake because you go a lot faster than you could mowing. And plus, uh, as light as that little Ford 8-in tractor was when you had that John Deere side delivery rake on the back and you raised it off the ground, I could pop wheelies and that was extremely fun for a nine or 10 year old kid out there raking hay. But that's what we used to put the hay in windrows before we, the final stage of harvesting. Once the hay was in windrows, then we picked it up and, and put it onto a truck or trailer using a new idea brand, a uh, loose hay loader. It hooked to the back of your either truck or your hay trailer and it lifted the windrow up into the truck and you'd, you'd be there with a pitchfork to take it off the top of the loose hay loader and then place it around on the bed of the truck. In our instance, we used a truck uh, and then tromp it in so that you could get more. Now we used, a, it was a 1940s something, two ton uh, Chevy truck with a flatbed on it. And the hay that we cut primarily was alfalfa, so it held together good to place it around in the truck and tromp it down. I started driving that truck in the hay field at probably seven or eight years of age. I know that seems awfully young in today's time. I would drive the truck and dad would be on the back placing the hay around the bed. We could haul about eight to 10 tons of alfalfa hay on this truck once it was fully loaded. So it, you know, it took quite a little while uh, for me driving it. And I, you say, well, how can a seven or eight year old, and that's about how old I was, how could they drive the truck? Well, dad would adjust the throttle so that it was kind of at a high idle. And our alfalfa was grown on a flat creek bottom. Uh, so you didn't have to operate the gas pedal and he once he got that throttle set. Now he would put two Sears and Roebuck catalogs under my butt, probably the uh, uh, fall and winter edition plus the spring and summer edition to get me up where I could see over the steering wheel. Now he had no power steering naturally, but once he would get the truck in gear and started, then he would jump out and get on the bed of the truck and turn it over to me. And I would try to straddle the windrow 
Uh, and, and it was really pretty easy, except when you got to the corners with no power steering, it was all I could do at seven or eight years of age to turn that steering wheel and make the corner. And the only instructions I had from him in case of emergency, in case I couldn't uh, turn the steering wheel quick enough to avoid uh, the fence at the corner, or more importantly, there was a creek that ran along one side of the hayfield to uh, hit the kill switch and shut it off rather than run into the fence or the creek. Now, unloading the hay was a process all in its own. Uh, if you've seen old barns, you, you may have wondered what that one peak that sticks out on the end of the barn is. And that's most likely like our barn was. We had a steel track that ran down the uh, inside of the apex of the roof and there was a carriage attachment that used that would hook into that. And this carriage would come down on the truck, had usually had four big curved forks. Uh, Dad would place those in as much hay as he could get. It'd pull up about a ton as you go. And then you'd have a tractor hooked on the other end of the barn to a cable to pull that carriage up. It would go straight up straight vertically up uh, to, to that peak of the roof, and then it would hit the track, and then it would go slide down, roll down the track, it was on rollers, uh, until you got to the place where you wanted to dump it, and then the tractor would stop, and there was a rope attached to it, and Dad would jerk that rope real quickly, and those forks would come undone and allow the hay to fall down uh, to the ground of that barn. Now, our barn, we had uh, six different sections. Uh, there was a joist going across uh, in, in five different places of the barn. So you had to dump the hay in between those joists so that you didn't break those. And once it was dumped in the barn, uh, either me or dad or maybe even a neighbor or a hired hand would scatter that uh, hay around with a pitchfork so that it was kind of flat and even and ready for the next load. And once we got all the hay harvested for the year and because it was alfalfa, we'd usually have four or five different cuttings throughout the summer and we'd get that barn pretty full. But feeding the hay during the winter uh, was a fairly simple process. We had a wooden hay manger that ran the entire length of the barn on one side. So you would simply use a pitchfork to gather or pull the hay out of the stacks in the barn and throw it in this wooden uh, slatted manger. And the cows, and we never had over probably 25 or 30 cows, they would all line up next to each other and eat uh, hay out of that wooden manger. So, you know, it, we didn't have to haul it anywhere. Now, later on, uh, you know, we did have more cows and, and we built a, a wooden manger on wheels that we could fill there at the barn and pull behind the tractor out into the field so more cows could eat around it. Um, you know, that wooden portable manger was probably 16, 18 feet long. And uh, again, we could pull it out the tractor and move it every day so we didn't kill out the grass in one spot. And that's the way we put up and fed loose hay. Tremendous amount of hard physical labor. We bought our first small square baler in uh, probably 19, the mid 1960s. I was just getting ready to enter high school. And really I thought we had all died and gone to heaven. That was so much easier than putting up loose hay. So you can imagine how much work putting up the loose hay was. Well, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, had lots of good comments about our first episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. And if any of you out there would like a certain aspect of agriculture, uh, forgotten knowledge, uh, visited about or reminisced about, uh, leave your suggestions in the comments portion of this. And if I know anything about it or if I experienced that as a kid, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk about that for a while. Thanks for watching. See you next time.